It's 6.30 on a Thursday evening, but the busy part of Josh Campbell's workday hasn't begun. Tonight we're going to do our annual assessment of the maternity in Bachelor County that resides here during the summertime. Those residents are 250,000 endangered gray bats, making their home in Bellamy Cave, just outside of Clarksville. They come out, about the time they get that tree, they circle and gain altitude right here. Because of elevation changes within the cave, Bellamy has a rare mix of both warm and cold air pockets, allowing it to house gray bats year round. The bachelor colony males sleep during the day and they go feed during the night. The females are in a different part of the cave where they're raising their pups. And that warm air that's being trapped by the cave is very important for the development of the pups. And it's also important for the females because during their pregnancy and after birth, they lose the ability to regulate their body temperature. Josh and his team of biologists are setting up harp traps to capture the bats as they leave the cave on their nightly foray for food. Once the traps are ready, the wait is on for a setting sun to invite the bats out. This one is probably one of the more impressive emergences I've seen here in Tennessee because the bats are restricted to a very small entrance. They will create their own wind during the emergence and the vegetation will blow, but they'll also suck the cold air out. So as the bats are flying out, the temperature around the cave will drop. While the temperature drops, the action heats up. Bats with their echolocation are able to detect that first row of monofilament, and so they'll actually turn mid-flight and try to fly between it, which really speaks to the bat's agility in flight. But once they fly through, they don't have enough time to pick up the second row of monofilament, which is offset, and actually hit that, and they'll spiral down into the basket. The bats are collected in paper bags, then examined by biologists who have to work quickly, since the banding permit requires the animals be held no longer than 30 minutes to minimize their stress. One of the main objectives is just to see sex ratios, males to females, look at recruitment, how many juveniles are we catching. We're also really interested in looking at band recoveries, so that shows that these bats are surviving from year to year. All right, so male. We look where the wing membrane attaches okay. to the leg, and if it attaches at the ankle, then we know it's a gray bat. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we'll sex the bat age it. Yeah, On females, we'll look to see if it's lactating. We're also looking for the wings to see if there's any scarring for wing damage. The wing damage is a sign of white nose syndrome, a deadly fungal disease that has killed millions of bats since it was first discovered in 2006. This is one of the two worst was it we've seen tonight. And we're noticing a lot of blotching on the right wing. It looks almost kind of leucistic. Some of the dark pigmentation is absent. It's almost a translucent, and so that's usually an indication of white nose syndrome scarring, referred to as blotching. While white nose has decimated some species, like little brown and tricolored bats in Tennessee, gray bats appear to be better at surviving the disease. In fact, the population at Bellamy has nearly tripled over the last seven years, and biologists want to know why. These bats have very low fungal load, meaning they don't have very many spores on them, and the prevalence or the number of individuals that are found positive for the fungus is also very low. So there's something special going on with these bats. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that they live and survive and thrive in caves winter and summer, and so there might be some sort of microbiota that's on them. Gray bats are naturally more active during hibernation and are larger and have more fat reserves, which could also help fight the disease. Gray bat, female. Each bat is banded before being released. Males on the right wing, females on the left. If you can read the numbers on the band on the wall, and then if you can see which side of the bat the band is on, you'll know whether it's male or female without having to disturb it during the hibernation. The bands are used to gather migration information. We follow bats that fly two, three hundred miles a year to go from a winter cave to a, a, a single tree in North Alabama or North Mississippi. And it's just amazing to see something so small travel so far. We've actually been able to connect this cave to several caves in Kentucky and a large cave system in North Alabama. We've picked up bands from the Shawnee National Forest in Illinois, which speaks to how far gray bats will move each year. So we're learning a lot about their movement patterns. And hopefully, through continued research at Bellamy and other caves, learning how to better protect these often misunderstood animals that help us in hidden ways. Brazilian free-tailed bats, for instance, will fly over these 
large crops in Texas and can eat several metric tons per night of these huge insects. And they do the same here, although we're not a huge agricultural area, as far as the avoided cost of added pesticides, it saves the U.S. billions upon billions of dollars by having bats in the ecosystem, and not to mention forest pests. I mean, we have a lot of those invasive species that are coming in and, and harming our natural forests, and bats will eat those as well. Bats are really cool, they're great for the environment, and they're not as scary as we all think they are. I'm Ken Tucker, on the wild side.